incredible study abroad experience, but also um, try and make up for lost ground um, for all the time that you haven't been able to spend interacting with your friends on campus and otherwise. Um, my name is Lawrence Kruger. I've been running uh, the OTS programs in South Africa for oh, 18 years now. And um, every trip is an adventure. And I'll start with that and finish with that. So Don, do you want to perhaps introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Don, or Donovan Tai. I'm the, um, based here in Skakuza in Kruger National Park, South Africa, where we oversee our field station here, where you guys will be spending a lot of time um, over the next upcoming months, which is which will be great. So it's been a quiet time here for us in Skakuza over the last almost two years now. Um, so we're really looking forward to having some long stay guests and researchers and students um, at the campus again and and uh, yeah really getting a good a good research vibe um, going again at the campus. So I'll be seeing you guys a lot while in Skukuza, uh, maybe bits and pieces up north in the Kruger and maybe in the Cape. Um, but you'll be spending the majority of your time with um, the other lecturers on the course, Lisa and Gareth, who unfortunately haven't been, aren't able to join us today, but we'll be meeting them soon over email and yeah, once you get here in South Africa and online before that. Um, yeah, so looking forward to meeting you guys and having you there in Skakuza. Great. Um, maybe I wonder if we could just go around and maybe students can just give a, a real brief introduction, your name, where you go to school, um, and then maybe something you're looking forward to about the program. Something real quick, we don't need to take up a lot of time, but um, I can uh, call on people. So I, first person on my screen I, I see is Isabel, if you can uh, unmute yourself and give a quick intro, thanks. Hi, I'm Isabel, I'm a junior at Amherst. Um, I'm from like the Boston area and I'm very excited to hang out with all of you guys and see all the animals at Kruger. Nice, yes, that you will, uh, there will be quite a few, quite a few for sure. You won't be disappointed. Um, so, okay, so next up, uh, Samantha. Hi, um, I'm Sam. I go to College of the Holy Cross in Worcester and I also live in the Boston area. Um, and I am very excited to learn more about the history of South Africa while obviously being in South Africa and seeing it all. Absolutely. Yeah, I think this, this program does a great job of uh, incorporating the history of South Africa in um, the entire program. So lots to learn. Um, so going from one Holy Cross student to another, Andrew. Hey, I'm Andrew and um, I'm also, I also go to the College of the Holy Cross. I'm from the Philadelphia area. And uh, I'm most excited to start the field work in South Africa. Awesome. Field work, field work uh, will be, there will be plenty of opportunities to do that while you're there, for sure. All right, next up, uh, Oliver. Hey, I'm Oliver. I'm, uh, I go to the University of the South in Swanee, by Tennessee. I'm a junior year. Uh, yeah, I'm a junior there, and I'm really interested in the botany of South Africa. So, like, seeing all the plant diversity there is what I'm by far the most excited about. Excellent. Excellent. It's good to see you, Oliver. Um, next up, uh, Julia. Hi, I'm Julia. Um, I'm a junior. I go to the University of Connecticut. I'm from Connecticut. Um, and I'm most excited to meet all of you guys and have a new experience. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, next, uh, I think, is Georgia. Hi, I'm Georgia. I'm a junior at Cornell and I'm from Seattle and I'm just excited to do field work. Nice. I'm also from Seattle, Georgia, so welcome. Um, all right, next up I think is gonna be Emma. Hi, um, I'm Emma. I'm um, from UCT in Cape Town and originally from Joburg, so I'm a South African local. Um, and I'm really excited to hopefully maybe get a bit of a better idea of what exactly in conservation I want to end up working in. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for joining. Uh, next up, I think, is Maya. Hi, I'm Maya. Um, I go to Grinnell College, which is in Iowa, and I'm from New York City. Um, and the thing I'm most excited about is to do field work, especially after missing out on it for a few years. Nice. 
Yes. Uh, okay, Sierra, I think you're up next. Hi, I'm Sierra. I go to Colorado College. Um, I'm from central Minnesota. I'm also a junior and I'm most excited to gain research experience. Excellent. Um, and I think Clarissa, are you there? I don't see you on my screen, but if you are there, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. I am here. Um, my name is Clarissa. I am also from Minnesota and I go to Wellesley College. I don't know what else. This it's all good. Like... Just something, something maybe you're uh, excited or looking forward to on the program. I'm excited for the animals. Excellent. Yeah. It's one of the favorite. I think, well, when I went a few years ago, it was one of the most memorable parts of the trip for sure. So um, great. So a lot of interest in field work. Uh, sounds like we got a good crew here. Um, some students interested in, in the wildlife and botany. So it's a good mix. And uh, yeah, with that being said, I think what I'll do is I'll hand it over to Lawrence. He's got a few slides. Uh, he's going to go over kind of where you guys are going to be visiting. Uh, the sites, um, why they're important. And then after that, we'll kind of go through some of, uh, we'll go through some logistics, talk about um, questions and important items that y'all need to uh, take note of before you depart. And yeah, and then also we'll open up to, to questions from you guys. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Lawrence to kind of go through the itinerary. Great, so I'm gonna keep this relatively brief just to maintain some of the suspense because if I gave it all away here, then I'd have nothing to say at the real introduction to the program. But I do wanna give you a sense of where we'll be going and why we'll be going to some of those places. And now for some wonderful reason, uh, let's see if that works, there we go, okay. So um, you guys are getting some of the best education possible um, on your campuses back home. And so our job is to rend all that theory you've learned alive in the field. So we have um, the focus of our academic efforts on the program is to give you a well-rounded introduction to ecology, uh, the conservation for uh, people and nature, uh, the history and culture of South Africa as sort of context for uh, the other two courses. And then the, the fourth course is a kind of a, a toolbox course. So when we started this program, many of the students would have been uh, ecology students. And what we're now finding is that students arrive with a far broader range of interests, which is actually to the benefit of, of a program like this because uh, a broader base offers uh, more interesting conversations and debates. Um, but what we do need to do is get everybody on the same page. So um, the course is structured in such a way that you, uh, by the end of the course, will have a, a reasonable understanding of, of the fundamental theories of ecology or, or conservation. Um, we will also then add a South African flavor and what makes African and particularly Southern African ecology and conservation interesting uh, to provide context for the kind of work that you will go on to do for the rest of your careers. So uh, by the time you leave South Africa, you must have a more sort of rounded understanding of ecology and conservation. Um, the, the other explicit aim of, of the way we structure the academics is that um, it's important that you guys leave with a social, uh, a social ecological understanding of both ecology and conservation. So it's not good enough just to focus our attentions inside protected areas and um, uh, intact ecosystems that maintain the ecological integrity, but also to look outside of protected areas. So across land use change gradients to get a clearer sense of, of the ecology of these system inside systems inside and outside of protected areas. So academically, our job is to broaden your horizon somewhat. And I'm glad a couple of you mentioned that you are interested in testing some of your uh, potential future paths. Um, but the other thing that came up often is field work. So obviously being a field course, um, if we can give a lecture about um, elephants, we can avoid the lecture theater and try and um, spend our time in the field looking at elephants. And so um, as much as possible, we try and get you guys into the field. So 
Um, there are a range of ways in which we're going to do that. So, um, for instance, we'll have driving lectures, or if it's super hot day, we've even had, we've even given a lecture in a swimming pool. We toss all you guys into uh, an approximation of a cool swimming pool in Skukuza on a 40 degree or 100 degree Fahrenheit day. Um, and then we'll just give a lecture using a flip chart. So uh, to be as innovative as possible and in the field as possible. But obviously also when it comes to the practical side, uh, we try and maximize that. So we try and spend at least half our time um, in, uh, in the field itself. Um, the other thing worth mentioning here, or a couple of things worth mentioning is that so there might be a couple of you that are environmental majors or English majors or history majors or economics majors uh, that have done one or two ecology courses. And so your entry into the ecological field might be somewhat thin at this point. So I've already mentioned that we'll cover a lot of ecological theory, but we'll also start, you will ramp up your ecological experience and your field experience gradually over the program. So we'll start with, just making sure that everybody has a clear sense of um, how to engage in uh, uh, science in the first place. So uh, approaches to science, um, uh, science methodologies, um, and start to the very small practical uh, experience. And slowly, as we go through the first eight weeks of the program, build on your experience. So we start with a, a small writing project where you will in two, three days in the field, collect very simple data, try and avoid statistics as much as possible, really focus on the biology. And then we will, um, you guys will engage um, in a range of faculty led projects. And because the class is so small, we'll probably only do four or five this year, not the usual seven to 10, uh, simply because we'll just run out of students if we had too many people visiting. However, you'll be engaging with a whole range of visiting faculty as you go. And the reason for that is that you'll get exposure and experience in a broad range of approaches to doing science. Um, so it's really important that you're not just hanging out with us in the field. Um, you know, there are four or five academics um, that'll be working with you and a further sort of three or four field experts. But it's really important to us that you guys get to meet a whole bunch of other scientists in South Africa and that you experience how they approach. Um, doing their research and you know the way that I do research might not gel with you but you uh, might work with uh, um, you know, Lisa and find that her approaches are, are far more congruent with uh, the, the, what makes sense to you. So faculty-led projects will do a bunch of those and different subject matter from freshwater ecology through to um, uh, rural resource use um, and then at the end of the program, we'll engage in independent research. So the idea is to get us all on the same page in the initial part of the course, experience a whole bunch of different ways of doing science. And at the end, we unleash you uh, in the broader Skukuza district and you guys get to conceive of your own ideas, come up with uh, uh, your, your fieldwork strategies and your data collection uh, um, strategies. And off you go for you know, between five and nine days, depending on the scale of the project. Um, and then you write it up as a, as a, as a mini thesis. Um, and so hopefully at the end of sort of 10 weeks of exposure and experience in the program, you're then prepared to do your own independent projects. And of course, independence is relative because obviously there's some constraints working in the Kruger Park. You need game guards, we need vehicles, you need resource people. So you can't simply step out and do anything you choose. Um, we, uh, there are some fundamental constraints, but the other is that we really encourage you guys to think about relevant research. Given, particularly in the South African context, the, the limitation or the, the limits to the available resources, very few scientists in, in our, our realm, uh, limited budgets for, for funding research. The work that we do typically, um, there's enormous need for that to be relevant. Um, relevant to conservation agencies, relevant to communities who might benefit from the kind of data you could collect, whichever. So we would encourage you guys to, in the 10 weeks prior to your independent projects, um, think long and hard about how you can make your time, uh, those, that last week of the that last month of the program, how you can make uh, a significant contribution to some 
locally identified needs. So it's not just an extractive experience and you guys getting uh, you know, the benefits of studying abroad and doing this wonderful work in the Krugen and otherwise, but you actually making a contribution one way or the other. And so I, I mentioned that at the bottom, you know, the strength of our program is that it's fuel-based experience learning. It's the kind of lessons that you'll never forget, but we align many of our projects to uh, certainly the long-term projects to the needs of the Kruger National Park and the communities inside and outside uh, the protected areas. We choose the sites that we visit very carefully. Um, so, oh, oh, before we get there. So these are some of the people that you'll be working with. Um, Don has introduced himself, uh, but it's, um, and I'll, I'll go through everybody in, in, in much more detail when you guys are actually in South Africa. But Don uh, was a student at OTS, came back as a TA, went off, did multiple masters, and is, uh, was a lecturer on the program for a while, and is now um, the field station director. Lani Birch is our primary history and culture lecturer. She uh, is based at the University of Western Cape, and she's primarily uh, an English professor, but she teaches the history and culture uh, of South Africa through the lens of literature. And so um, the way we like to engage in the history of, of South Africa and, and rendering that relevant to conservation and ecology is we choose a lens through which you look at it. Sometimes it's music, um, other times it's art, but in the case of Lani, it's usually through literature. So you guys be reading plenty of local South African literature. Nikki um, is the person that you guys will be dealing with more and more over the next few weeks. Um, she'll be uh, liaising with you guys about all kinds of details of your arrival. Um, but um, she is also the, the, the sort of communications and office backbone of, of OTS South Africa. Londiwe is, uh, has just wrapped up her master's at the uh, University of Witwatersrand, and she's a fabulous grass specialist. And so she'll be working with us as a teaching assistant this year. We also have a second TA um, who's gonna be doing other teaching with us, um, but I'll introduce her when you guys actually uh, do arrive because she'll only be with us for a chunk of the time. Gareth Hempson uh, was a student on the very, very first program. He did, he went on to do his PhD in Edinburgh on um, herbivore ecology and uh, postdoctor around the world and is now one of Africa's leading lights in grass ecology. And he's written uh, a fabulous paper called The Herbivores of Africa. And you'll be hearing a lot about him from about animal plant interactions. So he'll tell you a lot about a grazing ecology, a herbivory, and how plants respond to that. And in some cases defend, in other case compensate. Lisa Newpin is a remarkable academic with one foot in the genetics world and the other foot in the natural history world. And she um, did her PhD on um, seabird disease ecology, and uh, but actually is interested and an expert in a broad range of taxa. And last but not least, um, Emmanuel Zwane is our field lecturer and literally knows everything. Um, so he is a bird ecologist by our passion, uh, but he's really is one of South Africa's leading grass specialists. And so you'll get to spend a great deal of time with him in the field. Um, and then I've already mentioned my, oh no, I haven't actually mentioned my interests. My primary interests lie in forest, large tree ecology. Uh, but over the last 18 years, I've expanded into all kinds of others, uh, plant to animal interactions, um, the influence of vegetation structure on bird, uh, bat and small mammal communities. I do a lot of dung beetle work, all kinds. So in, in traveling around South Africa, you know, some, some study abroad programs are very field station focused. They'll, uh, if you go on SFS, you'll spend 90% of your time at one field station and then travel a little thereafter. Um, the strength and also the challenge of the OTS course is that we travel extensively. We try and spend about 50% of the time. So 45 days in your case in the Kruger, Kruger Park. And we base ourselves in, in the semi-arid savannas of the Skakuza district. And um, so as we travel through uh, the country, we've carefully selected our sites to as exemplars of a particular 
um, ecological um, habitat. So uh, around Skukuza, we've built this, this um, fuel station and you guys have all the bells and whistles available to you. Um, uh, beyond your accommodation and meals, you've got a state-of-the-art laboratory, you've got a massive library, and you've got all kinds of equipment. Um, but you'll spend most of your time here in, in the type of uh, savannas that dominate much of the South African landscape, so the semi-arid savannas, so uh, anywhere between uh, 600 and, or 550 and 700 millimeters of, of rainfall. Um, it's also the point at which we get to spend a lot of time with conservation services, and that's why many of you are attending this course, because you're interested in how to conserve and how to manage these protected areas. So um, over the time in Skukuzi, you'll be hearing about uh, the management of, of uh, the mammals in the landscape, because those have always for traditionally been the focus of conservation practices in Africa, and allied to that to be uh, disease ecology, and of course that lies squarely at the heart of um, Lisa's passions, so uh, expect to engage quite meaningfully in disease ecology, uh, but the other ways in which uh, conservators uh, manage the park is also the application of fire. We know that savannas are fire prone and there's a fire requirement. And so uh, look extensively at fire ecology, but also the removal of alien uh, invasive species, which was the theme of one of Donovan's uh, uh, masters. Um, after Skukuza, we'll head to Shingweti, which is uh, just a remarkable part of the park. Um, some of the, the oldest uh, um, uh, camps in the park. Um, it's the arid north, around 450 mils of rain, so very dry savannas, very different ecological dynamics, and dominated by sort of a monospecific a uh, woody plant landscape. The grasses are way more diverse, but uh, you'll be in Mapani felt with these odd outcrops of the fabulous baobabs. And in that time, we'll also visit um, the Iron Age settlement of Tulumela, which I will tell you about extensively when I see you, um, but it's a really important part of introducing to the theme of, of, of that humans are part of savannah ecology, that we consider uh, um, uh, humans to be an integral part of how savannas function and to visit a site like Tulumela is much like visiting Machu Picchu um, in the sense that it gives you, you know, that sense of history, but you also see the fingerprints of people, uh, sort of a thousand year fingerprint of people in these landscapes. Thereafter, we head off to the Tulu bush camp in, in the far north of South Africa on the border of Zimbabwe. Uh, and we'll be staying at, uh, as I said, the bush camp on uh, the banks of the Matali River. Sadly, swimming in the river is difficult on account of the numerous crocodiles. It's also where you'll be, certainly the hottest you will be in South Africa because the temperatures can get up to 40, 45 degrees, but a remarkable landscape. And what you see in front of you here is a Mapani felt and there on the crest of the hills are the, the fabulous Lebombo Ironwoods. And this is one of the arenas where you get to walk freely without needing um, any form of protection from wild animals. And so the hikes in this area are truly remarkable. And you guys will be staying in these amazing tents on the, the banks of the Matali. And in the mornings, you'll be woken up by the barking baboons and the clanking of cowbells, a truly remarkable part of the country. And certainly the, my, one of my favorite parts of the course. It's here that you guys will be interacting extensively with rural communities. I beg your pardon, I left the homestays in there, but this year because of COVID challenges, we won't be going homestay, but we certainly will be engaging in extensive workshops and discussions with uh, members of the community. And we have a really nice uh, faculty field problem lined up there with Chioneo, who's from the district and has done plenty of work in rural conservation. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, it's just really pretty. So uh, you guys will be welcome to uh, Southern Africa by the Milky Way. Um, so it's one of the areas that you'll visit that's least, uh, that experiences the least uh, light pollution. So truly remarkable evening skies, beautiful walks, um, and your new favorite taxa uh, will be the Baobab. And much as you guys are here to see the animals by the time you leave, you'll wonder how you ever existed without baobab trees. Uh, from there, we whipped you back down to Skukuza, 
We, you guys will be attending the network meeting, which is the biggest Savannah uh, network or conference meeting in the world. And you guys will be rubbing shoulders with some of the top scientists, um, top Savannah scientists. You guys will have to, have to, as an academic requirement, you'll be attending the conference and you'll be summarizing uh, key themes at the conference. So it's a great opportunity for you guys to uh, come to grips with what other people are doing. Um, and after a very, very intense four or five days, we will plunk you into a minivan, drive you to Joburg, stick in an airplane and send you down to Cape Town uh, for your midterm break. And there, hopefully you will get to visit Cape Point, um, uh, Robin Island, if we can arrange it, if the seas aren't too rough and start to introduce you to some marine and Fainbos ecology. Uh, once your midterm break is done and you guys have spent all your time snoozing, not going out at night, uh, spending much time <laughs> in the mountains as possible, learning to surf and potentially engaging a little bit of rock climbing. We take you off to uh, Krom River in the Stiedeberg Wilderness, uh, which is, again, one of my favorite places to take you. And this is where Don did most of his teaching. Um, uh, so Cape Town um, would be considered to be relatively music. Fenbos. So Fenbos is the Mediterranean type ecosystem. Uh, that dominates the Western Cape. For any of you who visited California, it's much like the Chaparral, uh, or if any of you have visited the Mediterranean basin itself, the, the, the name gives it away. Uh, but when we go to uh, the Cedarburg, we'll be heading off to the arid portions of the Fenbos, beautiful hikes, really transformative experiences up there. Uh, and then we go to Chlorpos, I have switched those around, so you first go to Chlorpos and Cedarburg. And there, but a marine ecology, and the fundamentals of Fenbos ecology. Um, not many mammals in those landscapes relative to savannas, but they do play a significant role. And so certainly want to make sure that by the time you leave uh, the Khrupos district, um, you will have a clear understanding of um, how Fenbos works. And then after that, you'll go back to Skukuza for your independent research project. So just to um, wrap up a little bit, um, the key aims of the OTS program are not like any normal semester back at home. Um, you know, we focus, you guys arrive armed to teeth with skills. You guys are ready in your junior years, your honors years, so third or fourth year. Um, you already have, what's the expression, mad skills. Um, but we just want to cement your uh, there, there's critical science skills, how to be an effective scientist. So whether you be a biological, historical, or whomever scientist, um, we really want to emphasize how to think critically. We like to believe that to provide you guys with a unique perspective on your academic and later professional journeys, uh, we focus on an integrated education. So we often speak about social ecological systems thinking. So it's not just about inside protected, it's about outside. Um, in the case of our, our health courses, health is a human rights issue rather than a clinical. So rather than a hyper-technical approach to our curricula, um, we might engage and indulge in the theory and we're gonna grapple with a whole bunch of different taxa, frogs, grass, uh, birds, whichever. Uh, um, but we always want that sort of broader integrated approach to understanding a particular challenge. So it's a very much an issues-based curricula and we squeeze in a great deal of natural history. And of course, our relationship between, the relationship between OTS, the Kruger Park and the community is vital in this sort of integrated learning engagement. Our job um, as study abroad um, specialists, um, if you look at funding agencies, both in South Africa and the United States, our primary jobs are to get you to study further, convince you that science is where it's at, not necessarily biological or, you know, or conservation sciences, there could be a range of others, but our job is to, to support your process. Um, and there are many, many elements to that, but it has to become an enthralling experience. It must be an, uh, an adventure, both a, a physical adventure, but especially an academic and spiritual adventure. We also need to ensure that you guys have the opportunity to develop your leadership skills, and there will be many, many, many of those. Um, and then the last is 
you guys arrive in the Kruger Park with a range of aspirations. It depends on who you've, you've, uh, you've grown up with, um, your peers, your parents, uh, which universities you've attended, to, ad, attended. But our job is to add to those aspirations. Um, and by the time you leave, um, some people find it very confusing. They're like, oh my God, I really thought I was going to do this. Now I definitely don't want to do that. Maybe there are a whole bunch of other things, but scratching something off the list is as good as adding something to a list. And for other people, it just absolutely cements their future. They're like, absolutely, that's what I want to do. Um, and then lastly, you guys are already in a very privileged position. And you guys have heard about this ad nauseum. I speak about ad nauseum. Our politics are clear about these things. But we as um, university students are and at university practitioners are incredibly privileged. It puts us in the top 1% in the world. Um, and so it's our job, our collective, you and me together, uh, we need to make a significant contribution to research in South Africa, but to also social justice one way or the other. And I'll make that a lot, make those pathways a lot clearer when you get here. And so that really lies at the heart of your experience in South Africa. And, and I think I'll leave it at that point. And then maybe we could go through um, any of your questions. There are a whole bunch of practical things we'd like to talk about yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Brooks. I yeah, think I think I was going to ask Don. See, Don, did you have anything that you wanted to add to what um, Lawrence kind of spoke on? Before we get into logistics. No, no, um, but happy to field some questions once we get to the points. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think what, um, what we'll do now is we'll talk about the airport pickup. I know in the past, or in general, students are anxious about this topic. Maybe it's your first time traveling internationally by yourself. Um, so I think the main thing to remember is, uh, number one, you all should have received, if you're coming from the U.S., you should have received an OTS t-shirt. Make sure that you wear that when you travel. Um, it makes it really easy for us to identify you uh, when you arrive in Johannesburg. Um, another thing to remember and is helpful is to print out the orientation packet. You each received one uh, with your acceptance letter. It also can be found on the program page uh, on the web's OTS website. Um, if you still can't find it, let me know and I can send you a copy, but that has contact information information about the program. If for some reason, um, you know, when you're going through customs, they want to ask all these detailed questions about what you're doing there, that's going to provide you all the information that you need. Uh, it's generally, it's, it's not an issue, but it's just good to have that uh, information as well as contact information uh, as well. And I think it's a good thing also to share with uh, parents or guardians before you leave as well. So they know uh, how to reach us uh, if there was something was to, to occur. Uh, but basically, once you come through, uh, once you get your bags and you go through customs, you'll see someone holding up a big OTS sign. Um, shouldn't be too hard. Uh, probably be Lawrence. Maybe yeah. Me. Okay. <laughs> uh, shouldn't be too hard uh, to, uh, to miss that or should be pretty hard to miss that. So uh, those are kind of the basics for the airport pickup. Any questions on the airport situation, how that's gonna go. And feel free to just kind of unmute yourself and ask a question. And there'll be other stuff we'll go into uh, as well, but go ahead if you have questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, what if we're flying in like the day before, like I would to do about that? Yeah, so I think there's actually a couple of you that are flying in early. What I would suggest is um, staying at the, basically the hostel that's close by to the airport that we posted on the Facebook group. Um, just book a night, stay there. And then you can, um, you'll obviously you probably run into a few people that are, because how many people are arriving early? I know of at least two or three. Oh, so yeah. almost everybody. <laughs> yeah, we'll, oh, yeah, we'll actually, we'll go down the night before as well. So we'll actually, just given how many people are coming in early, we'll be down there the previous day. We'll round you guys up. Um, I won't start talking academically at all until the very next morning uh, when everybody's there. Uh, but yes, no, we'll be on hand to to catch you guys at the at yeah. the, at the actually. Hmm, 
we'll, we'll send out some details. Um, but if there are so many people, then we might actually just be there for the at the airport with it with the idiot boards the previous day. Yeah, yeah, that could work. We'll chat about it. Yeah. Um, was there another question? I think Sam. I think I saw your hand. No. It was the same question. Okay, great. Um, any other questions on on airport pickup? If, if anybody is arriving the day before and ha has plans to say, stay elsewhere with friends or family or another hostel or hotel, just um, yeah, just make your way through to the airport the next morning and uh, head to the rivals lounge along with everybody else. Yeah, just communicate with us. And if you haven't already, send through your flight information so that we can track your flights as well. You know, flights get delayed. Um, it's helpful for us to know when you are scheduled to arrive so that we know when to expect you. Um, okay. Um, uh, just quickly, gonna... Brooks. Yeah, go ahead. Just quickly. So one of the major um, challenges for this particular semester is the potential to um, be delayed by you know, a COVID test that was uh, positive or something like that. So just to let you guys know that, you know, some in the, in the past, students have lost bags and we've lost the odd student who's been delayed along the way. We can always make a plan. Not um, permanently but if lost, you guys, just temporarily lost. <laughs> just permanently for two days. Um, but if, if there are any problems, not to worry, we can always uh, roll with the punches and be on hand to pick you up. So if you arrive a day or two later, we'll have somebody waiting at the airport. So you won't have to now make your own way to the Kruger Park because that's just that starts to become unreasonable. But say if they if everybody's staggered, we'll actually all wait until everybody catches up and then off to the Kruger Park. If somebody tests uh, COVID positive, we're just going to have to uh, work with what we dealt with. So um, Brooks and I were just chatting about just now. Uh, we would strongly encourage you guys uh, prior to the, your departure for the period that you're online, just be hyper careful. Um, try and try and get into some sort of semi-isolation at home. I know you guys are going to be leaving for three months and are dying to go out and enjoy extravagant time um, in wild places. But actually, you, you, you really are putting yourself under pressure if you do catch COVID under those circumstances. And we all know that Omicron is doing its thing right now in the States. Um, the data emerging out of South Africa right now is that it's not as, as virulent as Delta. Hospitalization is dropping, particularly if you're vaccinated, um, but it, it will prevent you from traveling for five to 10 days. I think if you're vaccinated and you have Omicron, uh, the delay is only five days, but if you're unvaccinated and you have Omicron, then it can be a 10 day delay. And that just puts you under pressure, puts us under pressure. So I think just be very careful, uh, make sure that the uh, COVID test is negative, and then it's a bit of a, a bit of a uh, um, um, gamble when you fly. You just don't know who. But just again, be careful as you go. Um, we need some volunteers to bring the COVID test with us. We're going to test you guys all for the first five days or stagger it. So we might start only two days later. And then if somebody is does test positive with with one of these rapid tests, um, then we'll just go into some form of isolation. Uh, uh, space and just be very careful around your health. Uh, but just to say, the only challenge for us in this program is your arrival and being delayed by COVID. And just it's you know you guys are going to be stressed traveling abroad um, and traveling to new countries. So we just want to minimize that stress. And the best way to do it is self isolate. Oh no, self isolate, but isolate to minimize contact with other people and make sure that you minimize the chance of getting COVID before you leave. Yes. Sorry, books. No, it's all good. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so a couple of things. So a lot of students in the past have asked questions about, you know, should I bring cash with me or what's the money situation? I think the best thing that we can advise is to, um, if you have a debit card, just take out money once you arrive in South Africa. Um, if you want to travel with a little bit of cash, that's fine. Um, but there will be plenty of opportunities for you to withdraw uh, cash as you need it in South Africa. Uh, and on a related note, make sure that you do let your bank know that you will be in South Africa and traveling. Um, I know it's happened to me before where I've gone internationally and forgot to tell my bank and then there's a, a they put a freeze on my account. So 
uh, try to avoid that if you can. Um, luckily, you know, all your meals uh, and transportation and lodging uh, are covered during the program. Uh, the only time it's not is if you're looking to, you know, buy something else or during the midterm break, uh, you are responsible for your own food, but we will set you up with lodging. So uh, just something to remember there. In terms of converters and chargers, best thing is to, to get that when you arrive. Um, we'll stop for probably the first day or maybe the day you arrive or the next day, we'll stop at a location where you can, or even at the airport where you can get a uh, converter and, and the chargers that you need. Same, same goes said with getting like a SIM card. Um, those can be purchased at the airport when you arrive. Um, it's not a requirement, but it does make it a little easier. Uh, the, the group tends to communicate via WhatsApp. And if you're out of, uh, if you're at a location that doesn't have Wi-Fi, it's nice if you have a little bit of data so uh, we can make sure that we're, communication lines are open. Um, in terms of uh, medication, so some students um, have prescriptions. Make sure that you bring, you're bringing enough and that you talk to your physician that you're bringing enough the entire time you're gonna be in South Africa. Um, some students have forgotten that over, over the years. Uh, it's, and it's also remember that, you know, students in the past have, you know, stopped taking their medication when they're abroad. And that's definitely not something that we advise or uh, a physician would advise to do. So if you do take any type of medication, make sure you bring it enough for the entire time you're in South Africa, and maybe even a little extra in case something was to extend your stay. Um, being careful about COVID before you leave, Lawrence already touched on that. So just like I said, be very smart, be very careful. Um, we wouldn't want a, a positive test to delay your trip. Um, like I said, but if it does happen, we'll make things work. Um, uh, but try to be careful once the virtual course begins uh, and kind of treat it, treat it um, as somewhat of a, an isolation period. Um, Make sure you have a, a location or a place in mind to get a COVID test before you leave. You will need to show a negative test, okay? Um, and then the last thing I have here is about um, family and friends, about setting expectations about your connectivity. So there will be periods on the program where you won't have access to internet. There won't be a cell phone signal. Um, and just letting them know that, that there are periods when that will happen. And so if they reach out to you and you don't respond immediately, it doesn't mean that you're missing or doesn't mean you're in trouble, but it just means maybe you're in a remote part of South Africa that, um, you know, doesn't have cell phone signal and they, you can't respond right away. So that's where it comes in handy to make sure that they have a copy of the orientation packet. So they know um, kind of what the program, uh, the, the program design is like, and that there will be periods with limited connectivity. Some periods will have access to a phone, maybe an internet cafe, and other locations like uh, at Skakuza where you'll have internet and access to laundry, access to a store. I mean, buying anything that you want, you can, that will be um, accessible. So um, just setting those expectations for family and friends that at times you won't be, won't be reachable. Okay. Um, I guess then the last thing is we have, um, we have about 80 total COVID tests, rapid COVID tests that we need to send along to South Africa. And basically each box is about this size, has a 40 test in it. And I'm looking for a volu two volunteers. If each of you, if someone would be willing to bring one of these with them, um, that would help us out a ton uh, and kind of assuring that you guys are gonna be safe as well as staff are gonna be safe, um, not only for this program, but programs that are having in the summer as well. So. You can think about it, email me afterwards, or if you wanna send me a note now, that's great. Um, but I, like I said, I'll need two people um, to take one of these boxes, okay? Okay, um, i trying to think if there's anything I forgot, Don or Lawrence, if you have anything to add or people, I can just open it up to questions for students too. Um, I just had a question on the, um medicine note, would you recommend um, taking malaria tablets for the crew day? For that, like, because you go so far north? 
Yes. Um, so we would encourage you guys to take prophylaxis for short, and but we will tell you which periods you need to take them. So given that Sandpox engages in hot spraying, it, it really does minimize the risk of contracting malaria. And we've never had a student on OTS contract malaria to date. We had a student after the program we'd call it in Zululand. Uh, but so 18 years, 1,500 students, no malaria to date, but primarily because students took prophylaxis as well. So we'll send out some details as well as how many days of medication you will require. So you're in country for 89 days. Uh, it's the Skuguza section, Shingweti and Venda sections that you'll need. So we'll send out a whole bunch of information just going over the details that Brooke shared with you just now around arrival in South Africa and packing lists and all kinds of things. But um, attached there will also be the academic guide as well as the, the schedule of the program. Um, and then a third element will also be the malaria medication. So uh, please speak to your doctors. Um, it just, you know, some people don't necessarily want to take um, doxycycline or malarone. We strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that you don't take lyrium. Uh, they don't call it malaria Mondays for nothing. Lyrium has uh, had some fairly substantial effects on student um, uh, well-being. Um, and so people might also take optimism. So whatever your doctor suggests, uh, please go with that. But we do have some fundamental guidelines. Yeah. Um, and uh, as far as medicine goes, please do also bring your own first aid kit. So just plasters and small bandages and the kind of stuff that you'll need on a regular basis. Um, Maybe just like, I, a, like a little travel first aid kit that you can get, yeah, yeah. You know, like a, an REI or something that's real small that has some band-aids and some kind of basic stuff in it is yeah, would yeah. be helpful yeah yeah absolutely um but uh please let us know and i'll say this now i said when you arrive i said halfway through and towards the end please let us know if you are ill and injured yourself and you are taking massive amounts of anti um anti-inflammatories and painkillers to mask the twisted ankle because you desperately want to go to the field the next day but you can barely walk because you fell off the cliff rock jumping the day before you got to let us know about these things. So the one proviso with bring your own medical kit is please let us know if you're heavily self-medicating for a massive scorpion sting and you desperately don't want to miss the day and you're kind of hobbling along gamely. So let's not do that. Sorry, that was a very long-winded answer to malaria. It's all good. Oh, uh, on that note, you guys have some of the most unbelievable uh, tick-borne diseases in the world. Um, South Africa has, also has tick bite fever, but uh, uh, ticks that, that carry uh, tick bite fever, but it's not nearly as bad as yours. Nonetheless, it can be challenging. Very, 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 very easy to treat. Short course of doxycycline, done. However, to prevent yourself from being bitten by ticks, you probably want to bring, and we'll send it to the paculus just to emphasize a couple of things. Malaria prophylactics, um, just some, some you guys would call it bug spray. We would call it insect spray because we'll get onto that as well. Like zebras are spelled uh, uh, not zebra, not zebra. But um, where are we? Oh, hats, sunscreen, loose fitting, long sleeved shirts. Um, so protect yourself from the sun. Bring your own big water bottle. Often people bring those rucksacks with a little carry bag and a travel coffee mug because you know it's a good thing. And a lunch tin, because you uh, we just don't want people to be wrapping their food up in plastic and you know, all kinds of things. So bring a lunchbox, bring a travel coffee mug, bring a big water bottle, a massive hat, and sunscreen. What happens is the very first day you all wear your hats and you put loads of sunscreen on, and then by day three, like man, I really want a tan, and then people end up going in spaghetti tops and not much else, and just people get nuked, and it's just not fun. Uh, to be uh, suffering from heat stroke and sunburn. So, yeah, it's gonna get I would hot. say check out uh, in the orientation packet, I think also has a packing list as well. So does, you can does. review that. Um, but I think something that something else that students often don't realize is uh, when you're in Kruger, you're going to be doing a lot of early morning game drives and you will be surprised at how cold it can get in the early morning when it's sunrise. Um, so uh, I know a, a beanie sounds crazy uh, when you're talking about 40 degrees or 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, 
but it's helpful to have a little bit of warm clothes with you uh, because of those mornings can be pretty cold. Uh, I know a lot of students that will just take their sleeping bags with them and wrap them up in it as you sit in the back of the game drive vehicle uh, because it can get pretty cold because you're exposed to the wind and the elements. So uh, definitely bring some, some clothes to keep you warm in the back of the truck. Warm clothes, raincoat, the Western Cape gets chilly four seasons in the day. It's good advice. Uh, unpacking quickly. If you play a musical instrument that is portable, bring it. If you are passionate about croquet, bring the set. If you love rummy cub, bring that. So games, musical instruments, frisbee, football, bring it. Oh, we'll supply the football. No, we won't, sorry. Officially, we won't <laughs> supply you the football. But when you happen to go to the soccer pitch, there will be a football there, miraculously. Good correction. Good save, Lawrence. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think, and there, like I said, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to buy things in South Africa as well. If you forget your toothpaste, if you forget your shampoo, laundry detergent, all those things you can buy in South Africa. There's, especially when you're at Kakuza at the field station, there's a giant um, kind of general store where you can get everything that you may have forgotten. And then a few more things that you didn't know you needed. Hey, just a quick uh, but, um, thing for you guys. Um, on that note, if there are any questions, I think it'd be nice to set up a WhatsApp group before you arrive. Usually we do it when you arrive, but maybe that's something we could do now, get all the staff, students with the OTS, and then invariably what happens is we set this big WhatsApp group up, and then the students set up their own WhatsApp group, but usually called Parent Free or something like that. And uh, then who knows what goes in that for us? I really don't need to know, and would rather not ever know, but um, let's set up a WhatsApp group for these kinds of questions. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, I wanna make sure too, that you guys have an opportunity to ask questions uh, I feel like we're dominating this space here, but other questions that maybe we haven't touched on um, or anything you guys are curious about. Just go ahead and speak up. Yeah. Well, in the orientation packet, you guys emphasize to like pack really light. Do you think we need to like strictly stick to that or will our suitcases be like, like if we have cars and stuff, it won't be too bad. I think the lighter, the better. Um, that's what I've heard from students. I think students generally bring more stuff than they need in terms of change the clothes. Um, so I would, if you're unsure, if you're on fence, I would, I would err on the side of less. Depends on what you suggest you're going to bring. If it's that's true, it's all presents relative. for all your friends. And you can discard them and then fill them, fill your bags up with curious later, fine. But definitely lighter is better. Um, when you travel to the other sites, um, you can leave bags in Skukuza. And so often we suggest bring a big bag, but then also just a small little. We will actually, one of your gifts is a, is a laundry bag. Uh, but then often students will leave all the spare stuff behind and pop it in the laundry bag and leave it there. So um, pack light, it's worth it. Yeah. I think a day bag is super handy as well. So something you can take to the field, you know, just like a normal backpack, nothing super large, something that you can put water, sunscreen, maybe an extra layer, um, but something like that is, it will be super handy to have in field days. I guess kind of going along with that, you mentioned that we could buy stuff once we get there. In order to pack light, would you recommend like bringing like travel size shampoo and conditioner for like the first week and then buying like a big bottle once we get to the base camp. Yeah. So what you can do in, um, on your drive up from Johannesburg, it'd be really great to leave at about 10 o'clock. Um, and that'll give us about an hour in Nelspreet and we can stop at a big store and you can stock up on shampoos and, and, and big stuff. So a great idea, just bring small travel stuff. Uh, anything that you feel that you won't be able to get in South Africa, obviously bring that with you. Um, but the things like toothbrush, toothpaste and snacks and power bars and things like, we had a student that brought half a bag of just snacks. It's like, so it's quite a thing. Um, we had a lot of snack bars at that course, but um, we, we'll stop at a, a store along the way and you guys can pick up um, all the necessary. Good question. 
I have another packing question. So it says to avoid bringing like a hard suitcase. And I'm wondering why that's the case if we don't need to like bring it with us when we travel to the different sites. Done. How many trailers do you pack? <laughs> Yeah, sorry guys, my, my incident has died a bit. Um, yeah, look, you, you can bring it along. It is, I mean, if, you, if that's what you have and that's a bag, then, then, then go for it, no problem. Uh, it's just the, the soft bags are often a little bit more flexible. So if you do decide... Um, maybe we lost Done a little bit. Yeah, I think it's just for yeah, packing purposes. Stuff in Sorry, Don. But, um, I lost you there for a sec. Sorry, you guys. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 So if if you, if a hard bag is what you have, then then no worries. But if yeah, it just a soft bag makes it a little bit easier if you want to downsize and you want to leave some stuff at Kakuza and you can still use the same bag and just make it a bit smaller. But if you would prefer to bring a hard bag along, no problem. Yeah. Don't feel pressured to go out and buy a new suitcase yeah. um if you that's what you got bring it um so would y'all recommend like a good size duffel bag or something like that yeah i mean if you don't mind tra uh, traveling with a duffel bag then yeah it'll work great and that's something that compresses down um i know um you know at times you can travel lighter you're not gonna have to carry that entire thing with you but yeah, Lawrence or Don, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah, duffel bags are great. Uh, rucksacks are fine. Um, what students often bring is a like a flexible REI wheelie bag that you can just pull along if you're not, if uh, if you're in the airport alone and no trolleys about. Um, the nice thing about South Africa is you don't have to pay for your trolley, so you can stick a bag in a trolley. But um, just a quick thing about the hard bags is just if we, we're traveling so much, they pack in, pack out and in the back of the trailer, in and out. So they do get a bit more damage than, than soft bags. Um, so and I would say just a protection of your bag. And I would say too that um, there will be areas or periods where um, a wheelie bag won't serve, your, serve you very well. So uh, it's kind of, you know, where your preferences lie. So there's times where you're going to be on gravel and dirt. And so maybe a wheelie bag isn't going to be ideal. Uh, but, you know, this is true for most, for most students, you know, bring what you have. It'll work out fine. I, I guess my question. <laughs> You go ahead, you go ahead. All right. Um, I had a question about hiking boots on the packing list. They said that like they're not necessary, but they're, so they're optional, but um, I was wondering how, like how much you recommend bringing hiking boots versus sneakers or both just because we're supposed to pack light. I mean, some people, so we put in a, we used to put in the packing list, bring some sturdy hiking shoes. And then a lot of the students said, well, oh, we would have handled this very easily uh, just in 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 decent trail shoes, um, so it's it's really just a, a personal preference thing. Uh, to put it in perspective, when I go to the field in Kruger Park, I wear sandals, so chacos, um, just because I deal with the ticks after the fact, and I hate getting hot. Uh, whereas I'm in the Fenbos, then I wear my hiking boots. Um, you'll be hiking some fairly rough terrain in the Cedarburg, but not with big packs, so you. So basically approach shoes, um, you know, just slightly sturdier walking shoes are, are generally speaking okay. But if you work in the field in with Kruger Park and we in in La Nina period, so it's gonna be very wet, your shoes are gonna get wet. And if you've got big leather hiking boots that just take time to dry. So a lot of people therefore prefer um, synthetic um, trail shoes or synthetic uh, um, approach shoes. Um, so yeah, I think something you know, the Merrill's or whatever. Yeah, I think something with uh, a little bit of protection, not having some, you know, if you had running shoes that are very, uh, maybe the, the, the outsides are very porous, that would not be ideal for field work because you're going to encounter some thorns and things of that nature. So you want something that's a little bit more, going to provide you with a little bit more protection. Um, and, you know, if you can, if you have something that can serve both hiking and field work, then that's ideal. Right. 
So there's like these yeah. are ideal. Sorry, since they're lying next to me. Does that answer your question, Maya? I know it's. Yeah, yeah, it does. I'm like, I have hiking shoes. They're pretty light, but they're like big and kind of bulky. And so packing them in the bag. Yeah, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Yeah. So my question was just. Oh. I'll go. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sam. And then Oliver. Yeah. yeah. My question was just uh, on the packing list. And also while you guys were talking, you mentioned like bringing a sleeping bag. And I was just wondering like how heavy duty a sleeping bag we need, like what temperatures, like how cold it actually gets when we'd be like using them. I think a standard Celsius. Yeah. Yeah. I think a standard sleeping bag, which is generally rated to 30 degrees Fahrenheit is fine. Um, you won't need like a, you don't need like a zero degree bag or a 15 degree bag. You won't, it's not going to get that cold unless you, you know, get really cold, then, you know, you know yourself better than anyone else. Thanks. Yeah, Oliver. All right. Yeah. So uh, you're talking about how y'all might uh, move up the getting everyone at the airport to the fifth, since so many people are looking to do that. I, because of my flight, uh, flight plans, I was thinking of possibly even arriving on the fourth. So I think I still might end up staying at the hostel for that. What do you recommend? Like, what would that look like? Like the next morning of whenever y'all are at the airport, do we need to like take the shuttle back to the airport and then join up with y'all? No, you can really do it either so, way. You can stay yeah. at the hostel. If you yeah. want to go to the airport, you can, but I think um, staying at the hostel is fine. I don't know, Lawrence, if you have anything else. Yeah, it, to be honest, I think it's better if you guys have stayed at the hostel. So um, do you have everybody rattling around the airport all the time is just gets a bit confusing. So I think if you, if you arrive on the 4th to stay at there, I mean, food you can eat at the hostel, um, but you'll be jet lagged, so you'll probably spend most of the time snoozing anyway. So we'll arrive on the 5th at about lunchtime, which is after lunch. Um, we'll probably head to the... So it all depends on when the, the majority of you guys are arriving. It's very simple to get the hostel. We'll send plenty of details. Um, but we'll be there on the 5th. Uh, and then on the 6th, we might go fetch the stragglers come back to the hostel, pick your body up, and then head out to the Kruger Park or whatever it's, or whatever, whatever the, is the most um, efficient. But I think just get to the hostel, stick around there, um, and you'll meet us on the 5th, and then we'll let you know what the best plan is for the 6th. All right, so I, as long as there's like a possibility of like being picked up at the hostel, that's my biggest question. Yeah, we, we're all gonna stay there, so it's, it's no worries. All right, wonderful. Would you guys recommend we get any vaccines like mali not malaria, like yellow fever or like rabies? Or do you think it'll be okay? I don't think we, Lawrence, I'll let you answer. I think talk to your physician and see if they, you know, if they recommend something. Um, but I don't think we're handling that. So you need to get the rabies shot. But I think other than that, just making sure that you're up to date on all of your other kind of recommended vaccinations from your that your physician would recommend, including COVID. <laughs> I don't think there's the yellow fever requirements in South Africa. So just again, read up on that. Um, Sorry, yes, yellow no, fever, we've... I think it's only if you're coming from a country that has high instances of yellow fever. So if all of you are coming from the US, then that won't be an issue. Sorry, Lawrence. No, 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 all good. And then um, rabies, the likelihood of encountering a dog with rabies is very, very slim, as is the case, as is with bats, incidentally. Um, but we won't be handling bats, just the, the ethics requirements around uh, trapping bats these days is just very, very, uh, it's, it's very onerous. So um, sadly, we can't handle bats anymore. Um, so no real requirement, but if you feel like you want to be careful, um, I mean, your physician will advise you, uh, but there's no requirement from the programmatic side of things. Other questions out there? Anything to add, Don, from you? 
Yeah, I'm sure you guys are really keen to see a finalized schedule um, that will be coming to you shortly. We've we've had to prepare, yeah, with all uncertainty around um, around the course and in the, in the COVID situations and Omicron more recently. We prepared several different versions of the course and different sites depending on what was happening. So now that um, it's getting closer to the start date, we've finalized booking, so we, you will be receiving a full itinerary shortly. Um, yeah, so just apologies on the delay and that we've just had to, to keep things a little bit flexible um, with so much unknown at the moment. Yeah, thanks, Don. I, I actually had a quick question about that. Like, what what will the online course like look like generally? And also, what will the hours of the online course be? Because we're all in different places. Yeah, so um, you guys have all probably experiencing some form of Zoom fatigue. Um, we offered quite a few online courses last year. And we found that if we were giving three hours of lectures a day, it's just people get fried. So we'd like to restrict the number of hours, um, learning hours during those first 10 days of online activity to probably two hours a day. There might be one or two days where we ask you to go to two and a half hours, uh, but with plenty of self-guided learning. Um, so plenty of papers to read, um, books to read for the history and culture, um, plenty of prep. So that's formally what we would suggest, but if there are questions and we kind of bleed over a little bit um, then um, into sort of extending the hours, then it's up to this, the, the group and the discussions that we have. So we'd like to keep it to about two, two and a half hours. As I say, we'll discuss it with you first if we need to go to say three hours, um, but it's just, uh, everybody gets fried if, if, if it go long, lasts too long. Um, we will set up a, um, a Google Drive uh, for the exchange of information, papers, uh, lecture slides, recordings, videos, all kinds of things. So we want to set up a really slick system, which we'll try. And then once you get to South Africa, we'll transfer it to an internal wireless system. Um, and the, that internal wireless system is just an Apple Drive with everything on it. Um, we'll probably do it in the South African afternoons. Uh, between say two and four or three and five. Um, is there anybody on the East Coast at the moment? Sorry, West Coast, East Coast, West Coast, West. West is later. Anybody on the West Coast? Looks like Georgia. Yeah. So most of you guys are on the West Coast. You're on the West Coast, huh? Yeah. Where are you right now? Uh, Seattle. Ooh. Um, okay, so we just need to take your hours in. Uh, into account so we might ask you to fire up your brain by seven in the morning but we'll see how it goes so we'll just um we'll start communicating with you guys figure out the time if it is seven in the morning that means it's nine hours so we might start a little bit later anyway we'll formalize it we'll make it reasonable for everybody try and keep it tidy uh try to keep things on track Things will change dramatically when you get to South Africa because, of course, in person, you guys ask a ton of questions and then lectures might flow a little bit longer. But with this online space, we'll try and keep it uh, fairly structured. And to two to two and a half hours a day. OK, so let's see, we're. We've reached the hour, gone past the hour mark. So I do want to be respectful of people's times and and uh, don't we don't want to reach Zoom fatigue so early in this course. So um, is there, are there any other questions that are out there? Um, if there aren't, that's totally fine. You can also don't uh, don't hesitate to post it in the Facebook group as well. Um, also, if you guys are planning to arrive the same time or the same days, you know you guys could be on the same flight. So um, if you guys are flying from New York or Boston or wherever, you guys might be on the same flight. So it's nice to, to coordinate some of that if you can. Um, I think, um, I think that's basically it for my end. Um, yeah, excited for you guys to go. I wish I was going with you, um, but I'm not. So you'll have to just, uh, enjoy it for me and you guys are going to have a great time and, um, it's not. Um, I think it's 
almost every student that goes on this program really says it's a life changing experience. And um, I know it, that can sound cliche and old, but I think it really is for, for most students. So uh, I'm happy for you, all of you to, to participate in this. And, and we're looking forward to obviously welcoming you to South Africa. And uh, yeah, so I think that's it for my end. Lawrence or Donnie, have anything else to add? We'll let you guys go. Yeah, just to say that um, I know it's been a difficult two years. Um, I also know that, um, and as we'll talk about this extensively in South Africa, you guys um, are probably the most uh, stressed generation of students in the sense you have all these external pressures and all kinds of things on your plate. You lead busy lives and so on. What we're hoping to do is set up an experience for you in South Africa, and it's collaborative um, effort. Um, where adventure lies at the heart of it. Um, adventure and exploration and, 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 and an inquisitive engagement um, that will challenge you, but at the same time, you know, add value to your education experience. But if, I think if we have that in, in, in a sort of in our minds from the start, then you know, the whole experience will, will flow. Um, and um, I hope that this is, a, is gonna make a huge contribution to your university careers and your experience in life. Um, and really looking forward to you guys coming out. We haven't had a course in, have you also got all that pent up uh, enthusiasm and uh, it's gonna be a riot, academically, of course. Well said, Donnie. Yeah, as, um, as Lawrence mentioned earlier, we've been running a number of uh, online courses over this last while, last 18 months. Um, everything from, anything from two week skills courses in in different emerging fields in ecology and conservation to to uh, online practicums and field practicums and that and it's really really great to have a group of seeing a people i've seen a group of people online who are actually going to be meeting at the field station and in south africa in the next two three weeks so um yeah really looking forward to having you guys out here and um getting in the field it's great to have so many people very excited to do field work it's definitely our favorite part of the job um, so yeah, excited to have you guys out here and excited to start the semester. Oh, with last one, one last thing, just um, if any, we, in South Africa, it's, it's always tricky for us to get some of the more specialized field equipment. So if you do have any additional room in your bag um, after you've packed Brooks's um, COVID tests and you have any other space in your bag um, and you are happy to travel with perhaps a small a piece of field equipment or um, electronic item for us. It's a lot, it's often a lot cheaper for us to get it in the States or a lot of the materials is not available out here. So if you are willing to travel with a small item, please let us know and we'll, um, we'll maybe factor it into some of the things we bring out for the semester. We're always trying to increase our inventory of, of new field equipment and that. So please let us know, we'll be very grateful. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Yeah, please let me know. I need two people. Take these with you. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we're done today. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'll, we, we are recording this, so I'm going to post it in the Facebook group. So if you you know, want to watch it again, or maybe you missed something, or you need some clarification on something that Lawrence or Don or myself said, uh, you'll have access to that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. And um, Talk to you all soon and see some of you very soon. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Cheers, guys. See you in a short while. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Recording. Thanks, off. guys.